Hello, my name is Keshwani. That's K E S H W A N I, Keshwani. We are here because we want to prepare for GMAT. We have been solving GMAT math problems out of this book here, the GMAT Official Guide 2021. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You're going to need it. Today, we will solve some data sufficiency problems that you will find on page number 215. Turn to it, make sure the book is in front of you. Turn to page 215, the very first problem, number 374. Before we start this problem, uh, and before I forget it, if after having watched this video, you find it helpful and you decide that you would like to work with me, that you would like to hire me as your tutor to get you ready for the exam, you can reach me by sending me an email at kishwaniprep at icloud.com. Let's take a look at the very first problem. Very first problem number 374, we are told that PQRT is a rectangle. As we can see here, PQRT is a rectangle. Along with the rectangle, we are given a triangle, RST. We also, that's all. And what we're being asked is the length of side PQ, length of this side PQ. This is what we have to find out somehow. Length of this side PQ is what is being asked. Let's see what the first statement tells us. In the first statement, we are told that the area of PQRS, PQRS, the entire thing, is 39. We are also told that the T to S, T to S is 6. This is what we are given in the first statement. Let's see what we can do with it. So we are going to have to play with it. Let's, let's, let's call this side, the one that we are looking for, let's call this side X and let's call this side Y. So we know that the area of PQRT, the rectangle, is simply X times Y. Now we know this side is 6, which means the area of this triangle is 1 half base, which is 6, times height from here to here, which is which is same as this guy, x. It's going to cancel out and it's 3x. So the area of this thing, area of this triangle is simply 3x. So now we know, because we are told that PQRS, PQRS is 30, 39, what we know now is xy, xy plus 3x plus 3x equals 39. What we want to find out is what we want to find out is PQ, which is X, which is X, P to Q. And we cannot find X until we know the value of Y. Until we know the value of Y. We don't know what Y is, what P to T is. And that's where we are stuck. Until we know the value of Y, this thing is not going to get us anywhere. So the first statement it's not completely useless, it's not useless information, it's just not sufficient. A, D, B, C, E. The answer cannot be A or D, it will have to be either B, C or E, depending on what happens in the second statement. Let's look at second statement. I'm not sure if I should erase this first statement or not. It all depends on, let's erase it. Let's erase this first. If we need it, we can always come back to it. Remember, remember we're trying to figure out PQ. And since we, since we have moved on to second statement, everything that we did before has to be erased. It is, none, of, none of this information exists. We don't know this thing. That's it. We can leave this here. Let's call this side X. Let's call this side X, which is what we want to find. And that's side Y, which is fine. But everything else has to go. Second statement tells us, second statement tells us that the area of rectangle, area of rectangle, P, Q, R, T is equal to 30. And, and, Q to R is 10. Let's see what we can do here. Let's put this here. Q to R is 10. Let's put it down here. Q to R is 10. Let's see what we can do here. Area of P, Q, R, T, P, Q, R, T, which we are calling X and Y, these two sides. So X times Y, X times Y we know is 30. And they further go on to tell us that Q to R, Q to R, Q to R is same as Y. There you go. Y is 10. There you go. If Y is 10 and X times Y is 30, that must imply that X is 3, which is what we were looking for. So second statement was quite straightforward. Not only we can find out, not only we can answer what we need to answer, but actually it was very simple. The answer is B. We didn't have to do much at all. Answer is B. Second statement by itself does the job nicely. Number 375. 
number 375. Oh, number 375 is actually a quite a tedious one. It's quite tedious, but, but we have no choice. So it goes on. It says on June 1st. The reason I say it's quite tedious is because there is a lot of writing on June 1st. So we're going to have we're going to have two people in this story, two characters, tenant and landlord. T for tenant and L for landlord. These are the two protagonists in our in our story. So on June 1st, the tenant T paid paid the landlord $360 we are told for for rent plus utilities for the month for the month then what happens in the story is that the tenant decides to move out early moved out early and landlord agreed to refund the money for utilities for the days T wasn't there. Question simply is how much is the refund? That's the story. How much is the refund? So she moves in, tenant moves in, let's call her she. Uh, tenant moves in, she moves in. Uh, in the beginning of the month, in June, she pays the rent and some money for utility. Altogether, $360, which includes the rent and the utilities. And sometimes in June, before the June month of June is out, before the month of June is over, she decides to move out. The landlord says, look, you paid me the rent for June. You rented the apartment for the whole month. You're going to have to pay the rent for the whole month. But since you're not going to be here the whole month in June, I will not charge you for the utilities for the whole month. I'll give you the refund. The question is, what is the refund for the number of days that she was not, she's not going to be in the apartment for the month of June? Let's see what they tell us. So that's the whole story. It's a very long story and you will find out in a couple of minutes that it's a lot of fuss for nothing. So first statement tells us that she moved out on June, June 24th. She moved out on June 24th, which means that she is not going to be there 25th, 26th, 27th, 28th, 29th and 30th. There we go. So the refund that we're talking about, the refund we're talking about is for the six days of the month. And six of the six days of the month Six days of the month is one fifth of the month. That's what we have to understand here. So that's, at this point, we know the landlord will have to give her refund for one fifth of the utility because she's not going to be there for one fifth of the month. That's all. Oh, that's that's where the story ends. That's all we know. Oh, that's all we know. The problem here is. We know that she paid $360, we know that she paid $360 and part of that was for rent and part of that was for the utilities, but we don't know what the split was. There is nowhere there that tells us what the split is. That's all. That's where the story ends. It's an anticlimax. Since we don't know how much she paid for the rent and how much we paid for the utilities, we do know that we need to give her back one-fifth of the amount of utilities that she paid us, but what was the amount for utilities? She paid 360 total. I don't know what the split is. The first statement by itself is of no use. A D B C E. The answer cannot be A O D. Let's look at second statement. Sometimes these questions they go on and on and on for a long story, and at the end, not much happens. In the second statement, they tell us that the amount she paid for utilities utilities was less than was less than one-fifth of rent 
was less than one fifth of rand. Now we know we know that she paid three hundred and sixty dollars total, because we are told that we are told in the problem that she paid three hundred and sixty dollars total, and the amount that she paid we are told is less less than one fifth of the rent. So how is how is the split going to be? Here is our rent, and here is the utility. This, the way the split is going to be is that the rent, whatever it is, from this we have to understand from this part. From the fact that she paid total 360 and this part together, when you put it together, this is the conclusion that she should arrive at. That the conclusion we should arrive at that her rent must be something more than 300, and the amount of utilities must be something less than 600, uh, 60 dollars, because 60 dollars is a fifth of 300. So we're not told that she paid one fifth of the amount of rent for utilities. We are told that the amount of amount she paid for utilities actually, in fact, is less than one fifth of the rent. One fifth of the rent is sixty. Her rent is three hundred. One fifth is sixty. But she did not pay sixty. She paid something less than that, which means the rent must be something more than three hundred. I'm explaining way too much now. The problem here is the problem with this statement is that the refund that we need to give her for how many days? For how many days? We don't know. Second statement doesn't tell us that. That means answer cannot be B either. A D. B, C, E. We know the answer cannot be A or D, it cannot be B either. When we put the two statements together, what happens when you put the two statements together? All that happens is that, all we can surmise here is that, when we put them together, all we can surmise is that, The landlord owes her, owes T, less than twelve dollars. That's all, because she, the landlord owes her one fifth of the utilities because she is not there fifth of the month, and we know she paid less than sixty dollars for the utilities since she paid since she paid less than sixty dollars for the utilities, and we owe her one fifth of the month because she's not going to be the, the remaining one fifth of the month. All we can say is the landlord owes her less than twelve dollars because we already established the six days she is not going to be the out of thirty days. Landlord owes her less than sixty dollars, but how much less than sixty? Uh, landlord owes her less than twelve dollars, but how much less than twelve dollars? We don't know. We cannot figure out the refund. All we can say is the refund, whatever it is, is less than twelve dollars. But we cannot give the exact amount. After all that fuss, the answer turns out to be E. There is no way. There is no way to come up with the exact figure for the amount of refund that the landlord owes her for the utilities for the remaining one fifth of the month that she is not going to be there. The difference, obviously, you understand it that the difference between the way we do the problems together here at a very leisurely pace, going into details because I want to make sure that you understand all the nitty gritty. The difference between this setup and the real life scenario is that in real life you're going to, have to all do all this thinking yourself quite fast. You just have to think very quickly and come to a logical conclusion that there is no way you can figure out what the amount the landlord is going to owe her for the remaining one fifth of the month. You don't have to figure, we don't have to waste our time to figure out how what portion of the month is left. Just knowing that she paid less than one fifth of, of the amount of rent for utilities, how am I going to figure out the amount of rent are you referenced from that? Because I have no exact amount. In order to figure out how much refund that we owe her for utilities, we need to first know exactly what she paid for utilities. Simply telling me that whatever she paid for utility was less than one fifth of the rent, that's not going to get us anywhere. That's all we, that's all we have to understand here. Number 376. 376 says x equals x equals 2t. And we are further told that y equals t over 3. The question simply is what is the value of x squared minus y squared? Let's see what the first statement tells us. The first statement tells us that t squared minus 3 
is going to be 6. Let's see what we can do with it. If t squared minus 3 is 6, that, that implies that t squared in itself must be 9. And that in turn implies that t must be either positive 3 or a negative 3. Positive 3 or negative 3. What can we do with that? Is that enough to figure out this, uh, this, this quantity? The answer is yes. Because we know x is 2 times t. x is 2 times t and t is either positive 3 or negative 3. So it doesn't matter whether, whether x is positive 3 or negative 3. All that means that the, all we have to understand is that x is 2 times t, which means x is going to be positive or negative 6. Because it's 2 times this amount. Similarly, from here, we know y is t over 3. Whether t is positive 3 or negative 3, if, if t happens to be positive 3, y is going to be positive 1. If t happens to be negative 3, we're going to have negative 3 over 3, y is going to be negative 1. It's going to be positive 1 or negative 1. There you go. Because we are being asked what is x squared minus y squared, not what is x minus y. What is x squared minus y squared, it doesn't matter whether the, whether the value of t is positive or negative because it's being squared. And of course, we can certainly answer, we can certainly figure out what that value is. It's just simply 36 minus 1. First statement by itself is quite enough. A, D, B, C, E. Since we know that the first statement by itself does the job, we know answer is not B, C, or E. It has to be either A or a D. Let's look at second statement. Second statement tells us, second, sec, second statement tells us that T cube is equal to negative 27 t cube is equal to negative 7, which in itself means that t is negative 3. There you go. That is also enough. That's even better than that, because now we know that t, t is not positive 3. These are all negative quantities. That's all. That's all it does. If t is negative 3, x is going to be 2 times negative 3, negative 6, and y is going to be negative 3 over 3, negative 1, that's all. Which means the uh, second statement by itself, Second statement by itself is also sufficient. The answer is D. 377. Three hundred and seventy-seven. Let's see what we have there. Three hundred and seventy-seven. Three hundred and seventy-seven says that we have ten students. who took an exam. Ten students took an exam. Question is, what was, what was the maximum score on the exam of these ten students? Let's see what they tell us. In the first statement they tell us that the mean is 75. The average score of this 10 student was 75. Can we figure out the maximum score simply by knowing the mean of a, of a series of number? Of course not. The mean does not tell us anything at all about what is maximum or for that matter minimum. First statement by itself is not enough. A, D, B, C, E. The answer cannot be A or D. Second statement goes on to tell us that the standard deviation is 5. So if you have a series of numbers, and if I tell you what the standard deviation is for the series of those numbers, can you tell me what the maximum maximum number is in that series? Of course not. Second statement by itself is also not enough. Answer cannot be B. When we put them together, it is still not going to get us anywhere. Just because you know for a series of numbers, just because you know their mean and their standard deviation, that tells us absolutely nothing at all about what the maximum value might be in that series, or for that matter, what, what the minimum value might be. The answer is E. It's not going to do us any good at all. And of course, questions like these are pure gifts because they should take no more than 10 seconds, 15 seconds at the most, because it's very obvious what's going on here. There's nothing there. As long as you understand the concept of mean and the standard deviation. The standard deviation simply tells us how, how much each observation deviates from the, from the mean. That's all it is. It tells us absolutely nothing at all about the maximum or minimum. Three hundred and three hundred and seventy-eight. Three hundred and seventy-eight. I believe that is the very last one on the on in the column. Yes, it's the very last one. So we have two hundred students. We are told, and we are told that we have we have eight eight 
cultural events. Question is, what is the average attendance? So we are running a school. We are running a school. We have 200 students in the school, we are told, and during this one academic year, we had eight cultural events. What the headmaster wants to know, what the, or, what the, or the headmistress, or for the Americans, the principal, what the principal wants to know is, what was the average attendance for each of these eight performances? Let's see what they tell us. The first statement tells us that each student, each student, attended at least one event. Each student attended at least one event. Simply knowing that everybody attended at least one event, simply knowing that everybody went to at least one of these eight events, does not enable us to figure out what the average attendance was for these eight events, does it? Of course not. The answer cannot be a, D, B, C, E. The answer cannot be A or D. The first statement by itself doesn't do anything. Second statement goes on to tell us each student on average on average attended four events. Oh, there you go. That is useful information. Each student on average attended four events. Let's pick it up on the top. Well, each student went on average to four, ten, four events. On four events, what this tells us is that what this tells us is that the total total attendance must be four times two hundred. Because we have 200 students and each student on average attended four events. Now we can figure out the average. Therefore, therefore the average attendance, of course in the exam we don't have to do it out, you simply have to understand that it can be done. Average attendance was, therefore the average, is, uh, therefore the average attendance was, the total attendance which is 400, 4 times 200 over the, over the number of events and that's all. Second statement, second statement does the job beautifully. Second statement does the job beautifully. It, it seems like on average each event had 100 students. That was the average attendance for a given event. That was the end of the first column. We're not going to start a second column obviously. We do one column at a time. We'll meet again tomorrow and we'll pick up where we left off in the multiple choice problems yesterday. If you wish to get hold of me, you can reach me, as I said before at the beginning of the video, at keshwaniprep at icloud.com. Alright? Bye now.